ಓಂ ಜ್ಞಾನಂಜನ ಶಲಾಕಾಯ ಚಕ್ಷುರುನ್ಮುದಿಥೇನ My respectful obeisances to His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, and to all of you, you are all Vaishnavas and the most worshipful in the, all the universe. Hare Krishna. In the journey in spiritual life, or in any journey, but since we're embarking on the greatest of all journeys, that is, going back home, back to Godhead, it's useful to talk about uh, failure. You all like to talk about failure, right? Say yes. Thank you. So because failure is a pillar to success, and Prabhupada writes about this, as I mentioned last evening, in the light of the Bhagavat. And um, Shami Pras knows exactly where that is. Okay. It's not, plate number 45, I believe. Uh, one day when I was staying at Govardhan Hill with uh, Tushta, Prabhu and um, and Parma Parma Karuna were there we go every year and stay at Govardhan Krishna willing and uh, at that time we were staying up on the roof and I remember uh, it, we were just there to hear and chant all day so one day I walked out on the roof and I saw Parma Karuna and Tushta Krishna Prabhu uh, as if it was like they had uh, found a vein of gold or something like that at a mountain somewhere and they they were um they they were motioning to me to come over it was kind of like urgent so i came over and and tush said i think we found something and uh they read me this uh purport from the light of the bhagavad and indeed they did they found uh, perhaps one of the most encouraging of uh of prophet's commentaries in the um uh, in all of his books and and within this uh passage uh, which describes how in the autumn season is a section of the Srimad Bhagavatam describing autumn it says it's, it's a mating time and during that time when the females become pregnant then it's comparing that to the uh, seed of bhakti and once the seed is there then it's going to grow and fructify so he writes devotional service to the Lord never goes in vain. Just at the right moment, the result of one's particular devotional service will come, even if one has no desire for it. I'll let that sink in for a minute. The pure devotees do not wish any return from the Lord in exchange for their service. They do not make business exchanges with the Lord, but the Lord out of his own accord fulfills all the desires of the devotees. It may appear that a devotee of the Lord is becoming poorer and poorer in terms of material prosperity, but factually he is not. The typical example is the Pandavas. The five brothers headed by King Yudhishthir underwent all sorts of difficulties because of the conspiracy of their cousins, headed by Duryodhana. But in the long run, King Yudhishthir was enthroned by Lord Sri Krishna and his enemies were vanquished. King Yudhishthir was never disturbed by all the calamities, that overcame them even though Lord Krishna was ever their companion. The Pandavas never prayed to the Lord for anything but his devotional service, and in due time everything came out in favor of the devotees. A devotee, therefore, should execute his devotional services with full energy, endurance, and confidence. He should perform his scheduled duties, he should be pure in heart, and he should serve in association with devotees. All six of these items will lead the devotee to the path of success. One should not be discouraged in the discharge of devotional service. Failures may not be detrimental. They may be the pillars of success. One must have good faith in the regulative principles followed by their self-realized souls, and one should not be doubtful about the ultimate result of such service. Rather, one must go on executing his prescribed duties without hesitation. And one should never be influenced by unwanted association. We should not consider going back to God at a plaything. We must take it seriously, as enjoined in the scriptures. For a strict follower, the result is sure and certain, and when the time is right, the result will come of its own force. Dhruva Maharaj went to worship God to gain something 
But when he actually came in contact with God, he did not want anything from the Lord. The Lord, however, awarded Juva Maharaj both benefits. That is, the Lord fulfilled his desires and also gave him eternal salvation. Such are the lessons we learn from all the revealed scriptures. The Almighty of God awards the results we desire, and therefore we should desire that which is eternal, blissful, and full of knowledge. In devotional service, we should not endeavor for that which is temporary and useless. So what did you hear so far? Yes. Going back to God has not a plaything. Is not a plaything. One has, must take it seriously. Yes, what else? Uh, even if there's failures in devotional service, we shouldn't be discouraged. Yeah, they may become the uh, pillars to success. Failure is as the pillar to success. Nagar? Um, the results of our endeavors become forcefully. Okay? Yeah, they, ca they, have, they come of their own force. Uh, at the right time, it will come by its own force. So you just have to be diligent and continue your service and have faith in the process. Just as the farmer has faith in good seeds and knows it plant, did everything uh, needed to cultivate the land, put the seeds in, water, I mean, you just have to wait. It comes of its own force. Devotional service is not uh, conditional bargaining with the Lord. It's, yeah. it's giving unconditionally, and whatever results happen often are good, but they're unexpected. Nice point. And there's a sense throughout this purport that uh, one shouldn't cheat oneself by asking for something inferior. In fact, in the last paragraph, Prabhupada says one should ask for that which is blissful and eternal. Why well, ask for further encumbrance in the material world by asking for anything less than that? Thank you. And, uh, yeah, more from this side. What did you hear so far? Any one thing that stuck in your mind? Yes. And even if we don't think that we desire to be a, a devotee, that we do and will realize that desire within us? Yeah. Uh, it may, it, we may not have a clear idea about our relationship with Krishna, but if we continue uh, in the process, Krishna will help reveal everything to us. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, so I'm going to uh, expand a little bit on the theme of failure as the pillar to success, because it's a good mantra to, to keep with one, uh, because so-called failure is inevitable, and uh, practicing any discipline. And uh, to begin with, there's, here's a quote from the person who founded the first volunteer fire department. You know who that is? For 500 points. Benjamin Franklin. He said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So it means that if you, if you take caution on the front part, and that's befitting for somebody starting out, um, going back to God as a plaything, um, one should be careful. And one should also beware of Maya because uh, she's very subtle in the way that uh, she presents to each individual person a particular package that is designed to um, entice that particular person. And it's not that there's a huge announcement. She doesn't make a huge announcement and say, I'm Maya, and I'm here to uh, take you away from devotional service. But, as we'll discuss in a few minutes, she sneaks in. But because each uh, individual person has a particular uh, set of desires, she can be very expert in presenting the objects of those desires in such a way that the mind may become bewildered. So one has to become fortified. So Srila Prabhupada said uh, once to his disciples that you're not 
sufficiently afraid of Maya. And uh, we find that uh, great devotees like Prahlad Maharaj, in his prayers to Lord Nishingadev in the seventh canto, ninth chapter, says, my dear Lord Nishingadev, everyone's afraid of you. And he mentions how there are uh, elephants running away all over the universe when they hear the roaring of Lord Nishingadev. And also, the demigods themselves were frightened. Even Lakshmi Devi was afraid. She wasn't sure who this was. She'd never seen her husband like this before. He was so angry, and in this uh, uh, unique form of Lord Nishingadev. And uh, then Prahlad, when he was pushed forward by Brahma, all the demigods offered prayers, and they didn't pacify Lord Nishingadev at all. So Prabhupada said, it's like pushing a five-year-old boy into the cage of a lion. Brahma said, you try. He came for you. So Prahlad began to offer prayers. And in his prayers, he says, everyone's afraid of you, but I'm not afraid of you. I'm afraid of your maya. I'm afraid that I'll slip and get caught and pulled down into the gears again. And he describes how the material world is a, is a crushing process. Nishpi jaman mupukarsha vibo prapannam. He says that the maya is like a huge wheel or a set of wheels that are grinding everybody up. So he doesn't want to fall into that uh, Vishnu maya again. So he's very wary of that and said, that's what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid of your Vishnu Maya. So one, one should uh, carry some uh, a healthy sense of fear that the, the material world is stronger than I might expect. Oftentimes people go to the ocean and there's signs up that say, undertow beware, and they go in anyway and they think, ah, you know, it's the beach. And then they get swept out to, to sea and drowned by the undertow. And um, people often too, we see along the California coast, Honeymooners, they'll go up to the beautiful peaks above the ocean and stand there and look out and think how great life is. And then there's sleeper waves that come. There are signs warning people about this, but sleeper waves means that there's a, uh, an inordinately large wave that suddenly comes out of nowhere and then pulls people off the cliffs and into the ocean. So one should be a little uh, careful wherever one goes in the material world and, and be wary that sleeper waves can come at any time, that there's an undertow here and not tempt Maya. So in 765, Srila Prabhupada writes, this is a regulative principle. One should not fall from his exalted position. This is a regulative principle. One should not fall from his exalted position. So the soul really is a, an exalted uh, personality. So we're part and parcel of Krishna. We have the same quality as Krishna, but due to misuse of independence, we've come under the sway of Maya. And in the material world, the three gunas are the controlling factors, these modalities. Uh, if one is affected by the mode of goodness and he goes upward, Urdhvam Gachati Sattva Sta, Madhyam Tishtanti Madhava, Jaganya Guna Vritti Sta, Adoga Chanti Tamasa. So Krishna mentions in the Bhagavad Gita the way we get moved around by these modes. In the mode of goodness, if you're touching the mode of goodness, then you go upward, Urdhvam Gachati. And if you're uh, meddling with the mode of passion, then you stay in middle regions. And then he says that if you uh, touch the abominable mode of ignorance, then you're pulled downwards. Then again, in the 14th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita world, at any time it can be toppled, and will be. So uh, one should write, uh, well, first of all, this is from 765, did I say? Therefore, while in the material existence, Bhavan Ashita, a person fully competent to distinguish right from wrong, must endeavor to achieve the highest goal of life as long as the body is stout and strong and not embarrassed by dwindling. So as soon as you have an inkling that spiritual life is important, you should use your energy as much as possible to advance spiritually. Because at some point, the body will dwindle. 
Purport, as stated by Pulad Maharaj at the beginning of this chapter, Kumara Acharit Prajna's energy and valuable human lifetime simply working like a cat or dog to develop his economic condition. For one word in this verse, there are two readings, Bhavam Ashita and Payam Ashita, but accepting the meaning of either of them will bring one to the same conclusion. Payam Ashita indicates that the materialistic way of life is always fearful because at every step there is danger. Materialistic life is full of anxieties and fear, Payam. What's it full of? Fear, in Sanskrit called? Everyone say, Payam. Okay. Similarly, accepting the reading, Bhavam Ashrita, the word Bhavam, which word? refers to unnecessary trouble and problems. So what does Bhayam refer to? And what about Bhavam? Huh? Unnecessary trouble and problems. We don't want that, right? <laughs> so in the material world, you get Bhayam and Bhavam. That's what's available. Fear and unnecessary trouble and problems. Put into Bhavam. Being per perpetually embarrassed by birth, death, old age, and disease. Thus, one is surely full of anxieties. Human society should be divided into a social system of brahmanas, kshatriyas, vaishyas, and shudras, but everyone can engage in devotional service. If one wants to live without devotional service, his status as a brahmin, kshatriya, vaishya, shudra certainly has no meaning. It is said, stana, drashta, patantyada. Whether one is in a higher or lower division, one certainly falls down for want of Krishna consciousness. A sane man, therefore, is always fearful of falling from his position. A sane man, therefore, is always fearful of falling from his position. This is a regulative principle. One should not fall victim, excuse me, one should not fall from his exalted position. Again, a sane man, therefore, is always fearful of falling from his position. This is a regulative principle. One should not fall from his exalted position. The highest goal of life can be achieved as long as one's body is stout and strong. We should therefore live in such a way that we keep ourselves always healthy and strong in mind and intelligence so that we can distinguish the goal of life from a life full of problems. You want to hear it again? Say yes. Okay. The highest goal of life can be achieved as long as one's body is stout and strong. We should therefore live in such a way that we keep ourselves always healthy and strong in mind and intelligence so that we can distinguish the goal of life from a life full of problems. A thoughtful man must act in this way, learning to distinguish right from wrong and thus attain the goal of life. Thank you. I needed that. So, um, before I move on, let's hear what you heard from that purport. Tell me three things that you heard. Three people volunteer. Yes. So, I, I think I didn't catch the last sentence. When you refer to healthy, it's not physical health. Is it more... Wisdom. Physical help doesn't hurt. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Yukta Haravi Harasya, Yukta Cheshasya Karmasu, Yukta Swapna Babodasya, Yoga Bhavati Dukaha. A yogi, in general, Krishna says, should uh, maintain balance in life, healthy balance. Don't sleep too much, don't sleep too little. If you sleep too little, then uh, uh, you'll notice in your japa that you start falling asleep. Or when you're behind the wheel of a car, or when you're in Bhagavatam class or anywhere else for that matter. And uh, you shouldn't sleep too much either, otherwise you'll be dreaming all the time and uh, you'll become bewildered. So in the eighth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, the story of Gajendra, the elephant, when he was being pulled into the water by the crocodile, Prophet mentions that the, the elephant is stronger than the crocodile except for in the water. In the water, crocodile wins. This is a natural place. So Prabhupada then gives this comment that everyone should live in a natural condition of life so that his or her senses are strong enough to fight with Maya. 
So you, you have to live a natural and balanced life. Your senses have to be strong. Your, as he says here, your intelligence has to be sharp. That requires uh, a good diet, um, exercise, sleep, and things like that uh, for, for you to, to use the apparatus that you've been given properly. Yes, one, two. Well, I, I'm recalling the, uh, the condition that most people are going between the gunas, uh, which I recall as being Thomas, Saraja, and uh, Sattva, I believe, and in that some people are uh, more in the middle if they're associated with passion, and that's the Rajas, I believe, and, and they have a chance to maintain some degree of spirituality, but if they indulge into the lower realm, I, I believe, Thomas, uh, that there, there's, there can be a big fall in consciousness that's much more difficult to get out of. Yes. And, and then that the the efforts that people make uh, are to transcend uh, uh, paya or fear and to uh, avoid the condition of uh, puff, puffa. Puffum. Puffum. Yeah, that is the constant dealing with problems and troubles. Well done. Yeah. Um, just a comment. But the nature of the modes and the kind of consciousness that they uh, produce, it's not that they produce consciousness, but that our consciousness becomes affected in various ways by the, these modes. And um, the Srimad Bhagavatam says, Partiva dharano dumas tasmad agnis trai mayaha tamasas tu rajas tasmat sattvam yad brahmadarshanam. So it describes in a metaphor that, that the uh, tamas is like the raw wood. And rajas is like smoke. But sattva is like fire. So fire is very useful. You can use it for Vedic sacrifice and for cooking for Krishna and so forth. Uh, uh, smoke, Prabhupada writes in his purport, uh, disturb, it, smoke disturbs, but it rarely serves. And uh, the raw wood means that one's in a helpless situation. As again, uh, Krishna calls it the abominable mode of ignorance. Now, from rajas, one doesn't uh, one one develops unlimited longings and desires for the material world in a sense that one wants to improve one's material condition. Therefore, in rajas, people are moving about trying to improve themselves in various ways. From sattva, the verse says, sattva yad brahmadarshanam. From sattva, one can see the difference between matter and spirit, and in seeing that one is spiritual and not material, there's a, a natural sense of satisfaction because we don't actually have to become something. We already are something. Uh, we're eternal. That's pretty good. That's better than pretty good. That's fantastic. And if someone's in Satvagun and can see that even a little bit, then there's uh, a, a chance for, for spiritual life. From Rajas, not so much. The Prabhupada writes in the Bhagavatam that from Rajas, there's a slight inkling of the uh, spiritual nature of the soul in the form of, of art and literature. And people go to museums, and they uh, read great literature and so forth. And there's a sense that aesthetics are important in life. But all of those aesthetics are based around the material concept of life. They're still in Rajas. But Prabhupada says they're, they're an inkling of the nature of the soul that wants to see beauty and the free light of the spiritual world and so forth properly. Otherwise, and actually, he's always there. He's with us all the time. Tarejati, tanaijati, tadure, tadvantike, taramtarasya sarvasyas, taru sarvasyas. I can't see him because my vision is obscured because of the lower modes of nature. But from Satvagun, we can have that vision. How to rise above the modes? Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Mamcha yo vyabicharina bhakti yogina sevate sagunan samatityaitan brahmabhuya yakalpate. If one goes on constantly performing devotional service, and constantly for those who are beginning devotional service means at least every day, don't skip a day, then one gradually rises above the three modes of material nature and comes to the spiritual level called Brahman. 
Thank you. One more. Yes. I liked the analogy of the sleeper waves um, because you, you may think that you're in a spot that Maya can't get you and you're comfortable huh. here, but um, it still can come and take you away. Yes. They, that kind of thing really fascinated. When I saw, we were in a town called Mendocino on the, on the um, coast, northern coast, California, and in the, I went in some bookshop and they have little warning signs all over the place mentioning that people have been sucked into the ocean from that. And uh, Bhagavatam has such stories. In fact, uh, twice there's a story of the Kalinga birds uh, told in the Bhagavatam. There's two Kalinga birds and they fall in love and they have a little family and they make a little nest. And then they go off to uh, get food for their family and they come back and one day the unthinkable happens and as they see that their little uh, babies are caught by a hunter's net. And so the female Kalinga bird then flies in to save the children, and she gets caught. And the male Kalinga bird, being so overwhelmed with grief, uh, blacks out of what happens in the material world. Everything seems just fine. In fact, Baba in invokes this Bengali saying that, I built this beautiful house for my happiness and enjoyment, and now it is burned to the ground. This is an aphorism that describes the mature world. End of story. <laughs> okay, so we have to be careful because the sleeper waves will come and get us, can come and get us in any, from any position, doesn't matter which. And therefore, as Thomas Jefferson once said, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. The price of liberty Yes, say the whole thing. So how does that relate to the context of the story, uh, of the narrative right now? Yeah, you do have to be aware of Maya, that, that, be vigilant. And, but, so tell the, what's the other part? If you want to be free, if you want to be, yeah, go ahead, you tell. You need to be ready when these things are about to happen. You need to be aware of them coming, not unaware. Vigilant, yeah, yeah. be vigilant. Um, somebody who has a dictionary? Anybody with a smartphone, raise your hand. Okay, please look up vigilant. See where it comes from? We want the etymology, please, if you can. But point is, liberty, the, the a freedom to move about the universe or go beyond the universe, it comes at a cost. What is the cost? Exactly, eternal vigilance. You, are, you have to be eternally vigilant. As long as we're in a material body, we have to be vigilant that anything can happen. And um, that is the price that one must, must pay if you want liberty. That is freedom from the um, binding force of the three modes of material nature. Yes? It says here in this etymology dictionary that from French vigilance from Latin vigilantia meaning wakefulness from vigilia see vigil yes so wakefulness you have to be aware and awake see vigil please Etymolog etymologically to take part in a vigil you have to be alert and awake the word comes via Old French, vigile, from Latin, vigilia, which was derived from the adjective vigil, awake, alert. So the notion underlying it is of staying awake to keep watch. Another derivative of a Latin adjective was vigilare, keep watch. Vigilare. <laughs> keep watch, which lies be behind English, Reveille, I don't know this word, reveal, surveillance, vigilant, and vigilante via Spanish. It came ultimately from the Indo European base wog, wag, <laughs> to be lively or active, which also produced English vigor, wake, and watch. 
Does that give an idea about what, the way should we should be? <laughs> yes. I think we touched on an important point that, that we have to stay vigilant to watch for for maybe sleeper waves or undertoes that could come to get us as they're all around. But I, I think to do this requires even a, a higher awareness or being even more awake. And it's not just you know actively looking out for threats and danger and maya, but it's even more staying focused and concentrated on Krishna to do that. Is there any other way? Well, both, both are possible. Uh, by staying focused on Krishna, there's a, a natural way in which we're fortified. As the Bhagavatam says, Vasudeva Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Priyochita Janayat Yashuvai Ragyam Jnanam Char Yadahaitukam That by performing devotional service to Krishna, one naturally gets as concomitants knowledge and detachment. So there, it helps one to stay awake and also detached so one doesn't get stuck again in the modes of material nature. At the same time, there are commonsensical ways in which, uh, for instance, Rupa Goswami uh, mentions that we should organize our life so that we stay free from the fetters of maya. For instance, he talks about atyahara, prayashascha, prajalpa nyamagraha. These are very uh, common uh, disciplines to don't overeat. He's talking about and uh, don't over collect. He says that um, one shouldn't uh, blabber all over the place, so for no reason. Don't don't get caught up in just talking all kinds of nonsense. Be be careful of what, how you speak. So the, these are other ways in which one can be vigilant as well. So both things can be there, and one should also uh, arrange one's life, he said, so that one's uh, always near the transcendental vibration. So if you have a choice, for instance, this is practical, if you have a choice, say uh, you get a job and you can earn $200,000 and live far away from devotees and have bad association, or you earn $100,000 a year, both of them are okay, uh, but uh, then you're closer, you, they'll put you much closer to devotee association, you know that you'll be able to come and uh, practice uh, bhakti and so forth, which one do you take? A, 200,000, or B, 100,000? B, 100,000? Okay, good. <laughs> you passed the test. So if you, make, if you make your choices according to what's most favorable for your devotional practice, then you'll never make a mistake. And even if you do, Krishna will make up for it. Yoga kshema baham yaham. If you, if you think of, if you organize your life in the way that you're, you're always uh, conscious of Krishna, one way or the, the other, then Krishna says, then I'll, I'll help you out. I'll make sure that everything works for you. Yes? Is it helpful for, you know, people do therapy and other forms of uh, personal growth that is about understanding your negative tendencies, and, and some go further in spiritual exploration, uh, evaluating their karma. Um, some even have visions of past life karma, but is it helpful to uh, get clear about what kind of maya might come to you? You know, some people, that maya might be associated with lust and passion. Others, it might be about overeating, and others, it might be about, you know, lust for status and employment uh, recognition and, and position in society. And and so I've noticed, I, I happen to be a Vedic astrologer, so I, I work with people around seeing what their karma is, and, and, and as a way to antidote uh, an awareness of what actually the kind of maya that's going to be coming at you more readily based on your karma. Do you have any perspective on that, based yeah. on that? Prabhupada, uh, Prajuna Prabhu, uh, is compundent as Prabhupada, if uh, Vedic astrology was within our Siddhanta, that is, you know, should we in, introduce it in our practice? Prabhupada said no, but then he, he gave a caveat. He said, but if you know it's going to rain, you bring an umbrella. So, um, the, the, as far as um, finding out the peculiarities of one's 
or the particularities, particular ways in which one's affected by the modes of material nature can be helpful to a degree. Uh, however, there's also a way in which one has to be careful with uh, uh, many of the kinds of um, what we call self-help you mentioned so in that genre because there's also a way you can uh, be victimized in that way too. And I've seen uh, sometimes uh, those who are practicing bhakti then uh, start to take uh, help from uh, these kinds of um, perspectives, you know, self-help. And then they become more absorbed in that than in their bhakti. And they, they develop more faith in that process than in bhakti. And it's evidenced by saying, well, listen, you can't advance in bhakti unless you do this first. Which means that that begins to supersede the pra practice of bhakti. This is a kind of, of mixture that is, uh, uh, it, it's a mixed faith. However, uh, six Kandos Srimad Bhagavatam, the whole discussion is about how the direct process of bhakti, especially chanting the holy names of the Lord, burns to the, the very roots of the kinds of um, desires that we have accumulated over many lifetimes so that they don't sprout again. Whereas it's very, um, it's mentioned there that by taking other kinds of help, uh, even including, you know, in the Vedic context of um, purifying oneself through fasting and doing all kinds of prayas chitta and things like that, then although one may be temporarily purified, those desire seeds sprout again and they come back. So the implication is that only the, the sprouting of Krishna bhakti within the heart can overcome those other um, anomalies that, that we've come in contact with from being in the material world. So back to the, the original point, to make it simpler, is that um, there's no... Uh, if, if we have access to these kinds of, this kind of information about, uh, for instance, if uh, you, know, you find out it's, it's a better idea to uh, point your head to the south when you're sleeping uh, rather than just sleeping any which way, you know, it's, it's, uh, it could be valuable, it, be, it could be helpful just as, as much as any other, that's on a subtle level helping us just as much as taking care of yourself uh, through a good diet can also be beneficial for your overall practice of bhakti. You were going to make a... Uh, just a follow-up yeah. When you're talking about bhakti practice uh, addressing the roots, that that's kind of what I'm, I'm getting to in that are, are we referring to sanskars, what's, what's termed as sanskars? Yes, sanskars uh, are, uh, as you know, are impressions that uh, uh, exist within the, the subtle body of the living entity uh, due to contact with the material nature in various ways over many lifetimes. But the, the original desire seed is, is that to uh, disobey, the, to turn away from the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That's why I've several times, already twice, mentioned the verse, Bhayam Dvitiya Abhini Beisha Tasya Ishara Petasya Viparya Yosmriti. The root cause of my material, my involvement in the material world in the first place is um, an unwillingness to serve the Lord. It, it, it's a, a kind of, it's irrational, but it's understandable in a certain way because Krishna is a supreme Ishwar. He has uh, complete independence, and we're a little stamp of him. We're a, little, a part and parcel. So we have similar tendencies. So we might look the wrong direction and think, uh, I'm an enjoyer too, and try to enjoy and become captured by Maya. So uh, the, the remedy ultimately is bhakti. By turning back towards Krishna and reestablishing one's relationship with him, a loving relationship, then the... Uh, desire seeds from the material in the material world become ineffectual, and other kinds of arrangements for for emancipation and liberation from the material world are are mentioned as uh, being short lived. Uh, Srimad Bhagavatam takes this view: this was spoken by the demigods when they were praying to Lord Krishna uh, in the womb, when he was in the womb of Devaki. He was about to make his appearance. They knew he was there, so they were praying to him in the womb. And they say that 
the, the um, kinds of liberation one attains through one's own, own endeavor uh, without, uh, that don't include reestablishing one's loving relationship with the lotus-eyed personality of Godhead uh, will, will be short-lived. One will slip from that kind of liberation eventually. One, one won't be able to sustain it. Furthermore, in the Madhurya Kadamani, Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur catalogs the different uh, stages at which one advances towards the prema. And he mentions the uh, level of purity that one reaches at each stage. And until one is uh, safely situated, not only in prema, but seeing the Lord face to face, <laughs> there's also <laughs> still some residual effect of being in the material world left over. So we should do everything we can to, to organize ourselves and uh, towards uh, performing robust a robust practice of devotional service. And if it includes some uh, astrological help to, to uh, help make us more serious. After all, when I look at my chart, I always see the same thing. There's ups and downs. <laughs> what goes up must come down and it'll come back up again. It's, a, it's, a, um, it's always a mixture of, of different things. But I, have, I, I personally have found it helpful in understanding trends and uh, uh, you know, one of the main trends is the material world is a very entangling place. Thank you for your excellent question. Very important. Anything else before I move on? I'll just move on. So, we talked about vigilance, and vigilance means keeping careful watch for possible danger or difficulties. So how does Maya sneak into our life anyway? One of the ways is that we leave the door open. And uh, uh, metaphorically, pride is, uh, if, I, if I become prideful, for instance, I think uh, my method of devotional service is better than everybody else's, and I'm an um, exalted personality and so forth, then this opens the door for Maya to slip in. And then uh, laxity, laxity in practicing uh, bhakti. When we, visit, when we visit every year when we're in Navadweep, the uh, Bhajan Kutir of Jagannath Das Babaji Maharaj and Samadhi. We always mention that one of his uh, teachings to his uh, followers was that the, the way to go back to God, Ed, to advance in devotional service, go back to God, is to make sure that you complete your prescribed number of rounds every day, even at the risk of your own life. Just put that in at the end. He said it's the most important thing that you do every day. Take it very seriously. And uh, don't become lax in your practice, because that it, the door opens with pride, and then when you become lax, that's what invites Maya to come in and say, "Okay, it's all right. You can hang out. I don't mind." Then, when she comes in and makes herself at home, uh, justification is welcomes Maya to stay as a permanent resident. So as long as I justify all my uh, laxity and the fact that I'm in Maya. I mean, there's a lot of ways you could justify it, right? Yes? yes. Like what? Yes, Chami Prash? Changing the philosophy. Uh, how do you mean that? Oh, change the philosophy. Yeah, change the philosophy. I can't do this thing that everyone else seems to be. So maybe they're not doing it. Maybe no one's doing it. Maybe it's not doable. Yeah, those Mongol arti going, 16 round chanting, who do they think they are anyway? Um, yeah, and it's, like, it's not possible. What other justification could you throw up? It's Kali Yuga. What do you expect? What else? It's fun, right? Yeah, what? It's only one day, one hour, just doing temporarily. I'll make a comeback later, something like that. That's the justification. Pros procrastination. Saying to yourself, I'm not strong enough. I'm not strong enough. It was kind of... Prabhupada mentions at the end of the 15th chapter of the Gita, the last paragraph, he said, to advance in devotional service, you must overcome weakness of heart. Weakness of heart means saying like, yeah, I can't do it, you know, sorry. And also, blaming others. Is that possible? Yes. Blaming others? Who might one blame? <laughs> You're so diplomatic. You don't want to name any specific entities. But it's possible someone could say, you know, uh, they kicked me out, or this or that. I mean, you hear it all the time. People say, you know, somebody else's fault. It's the circumstances' fault. It was, you don't know what I went through. This is justification. So, 
if you justify, then what you're doing is allowing Maya to stay. It's like, yeah, you just camp out. You stay here permanently. Make my home your home. So um, it's important to adjust the attitude. You've heard attitude is everything, right? Yes? Attitude is everything. So Srila Prabhupada writes in the preface to the Nectar of Instruction, advancement in Krishna consciousness depends on the attitude of the follower. So here's uh, some risky attitudes. Dare I mention them? Yes. Thank you, Nagar. Uh, one risky attitude. I am advanced. Very risky. This is an attitude. I'm, I'm advanced. Next risky attitude. I am liberated. I'm, I'm liberated, therefore, I can do what? not follow all the principles, hang out with, uh, you know, whomever I wish, because I'm liberated. And this is very risky, because this is exactly this kind of mentality, which is the opposite of what I'm going to name now, which are, um, uh, oh wait, there's more. I can cut corners, risky attitude. I'm independent, risky attitude. So here's how to lock the door on Maya by changing your attitude. Safe attitudes. I'm not liberated. Try saying it. <laughs> I'm never above chastisement. I live to be corrected. Yeah. Uh, here's a, a, a quotation from a writer who said, Good advice is not often served in our favorite flavor. So be open to, to uh, taking advice. From others, don't don't know everything already, and be above chastisement. That's that's risky. Also, a safe attitude. Remember where you came from. You may be in an elevated position now. And Prabhupada mentioned that he said when he took his uh, followers to India for the first time, people were worshiping them. He said that's because you're following the four regulative principles. He said so. Um, don't think that it's uh, that you're special. You're following in the footsteps of your spiritual master in the Parampara. That's, that's your qualification. Another uh, safe attitude is everything belongs to Krishna. You can say that one. That solves a lot of problems. Another is, I am the servant's servant a million times removed. This is a quotation from one of Prabhupada's lecture. He said, you should think, I am the servant's servant a million times removed. You want to try that one? I'm the servant's servant. A million times removed. Uh, I wear Trinata Pisunichena as a garland around my neck. This is one of the topmost instructions given by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is, uh, and, and by Kaviraj Goswami. He said, you should wear that around your neck, meaning you should always cultivate that sense of humility. Uh, then, uh, how to fortify and protect from the attack. Your sadhana should be strict, serious, and sincere. What should it be? And Prabhupada writes in the Bhagavatam 42425, keep your eyes trained to spot your offenses. So look and see where am I making offenses and make sure to rectify those as soon as possible. Um, some of the defenses uh, to get a taste. Get a taste for chanting and get a taste for hearing in all its forms. And uh, take shelter. Make sure that you have good shelter especially in relationships with devotees, and uh, be under proper guidance. So now we're really running out of time. So we'll take some uh, last reflections. Anything that you heard that you found useful that you're taking with you? Yes. Uh, an ounce of um, precaution? Precaution? Prevention is um, equal to a pound of cure. Exactly, yes. And who said it? Benjamin Franklin, <laughs> the person who started the first volunteer fire department. So, so yeah, this is a very important uh, point. Is it, it's, it's much, one thing I've realized, it's much easier to, to stay in shape than it is to get in shape. That's another thing. Uh, it's really hard once you once you reach a, a certain point of, of inertia, 
it, it, it makes it much harder to come back up. Better to, to uh, keep yourself going. And, and even if you feel that you can't do everything in devotional service, at least do what you can do regularly. Because even a small amount of devotional service performed regularly uh, is uh, very helpful for keeping one freed from the uh, encumberment of the modes. What else? No, there. Um, when you were talking, you really brought to the center focus that humility is really a uh, central, you know, aspect of the practice of bhakti. And um, not, I was just thinking how it's not like, you know, we may think that, oh, that's just, that devotee's very humble and that's very nice. And, oh, this devotee's not humble. That's just his personality. I'm not very humble, but I am. It's actually uh, so essential for the advancement in bhakti. And we all have to become humble at some point or another. So um, I was just appreciating how you are bringing that to the center, that importance of humility. Thank you for the point. And as you know well, in the Briyat Bhagavatamrita, Narada Muni mentions that dainya, or utter humility, is synonymous with prema. There is no uh, advancement in devotional service without the uh, ever-increasing presence of dainya, or utter humility. And in that section, Narada Muni mentions that one should practice humility in all the aspects of one's life. Like, uh, for instance, I just, one thing I, in, in, uh, is endearing about devotees is that they're, they're careful about uh, bumping into people. Like, if you ever notice in an assembly of devotees, if a devotee bumps into someone, they'll turn around, stop, and then, excuse me, you know, like. <laughs> This is kind of, uh, I, I, and I, I, on the opposite side, I saw uh, two people walking in O'Hare Airport going the opposite direction, and they were, um, it was a little, a little while ago, so they were carrying briefcases, kind of swinging, and then and they clipped each other, because they were both not paying attention. And both of them turned around and started screaming expletives at each other, at one another. Uh, there's a sense that, you know, like, with devotees, they're careful about, the way they interact with their environment, with, with everybody else, to stay in a humble position. Not to the armor man, 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 hey, not to the armor man, not to the armor man, not to the armor man, not to the armor man.